Research at Highland Community College. Dr. Arnett has an extensive and varied career in education. His resume includes award winning teaching at both high school and university levels and administrative work in both public schools and higher education. He has published numerous works, both academic and literary, and made over 4,000. Addressing different learning styles. He currently serves, and I'll have told you this, but as the Director of Institutional Research at Highland Community College in Kansas. So, welcome, Dr. Arnett. Thank you. There were a lot more wonderful things I wanted Kathy to say, but they told me I only had 100 words, so I had to <laughs> I'm really glad to be here today, and uh, I, I was amazed, you know, they started bringing out more chairs, and I thought, yeah! <laughs> and then I said something to someone, what a nice crowd it was, and they said, look, dude, they told us we had to go to one of these, we're getting it over with. <laughs> uh, I'd like to uh, start out asking how many of you are employees of Barton Community College? Please raise your hand if you're an employee. Okay, and I met at least one board member, so I know we have board members. So you all have some strong association with Barton Community College. Uh, some of you perhaps more grateful once a month when you get that stub that indicates your money once again has been deposited into your federal checking account. And I appreciate that. What I want to talk to you just briefly about is something that is very, very personal for me. I want you to picture, if you would, a brick house built before the Civil War, uh, once a very stately, maybe even imposing structure. But in the hundred years since then, has not been well maintained. The porches have all fallen away. The roofs over each porch has completely been removed. But you can see on the brick the outline of where it used to be. There is no indoor plumbing except for a cold water pipe running up in the kitchen sink. On the back porch, in a large galvanized wash tub, is a six-year-old kid in patched jeans, wearing a handmade shirt, curled up asleep in the April sun with four cats sleeping on him. He has started school at Trenton Elementary School in Trenton, Kentucky, just 16 miles north of the Tennessee state line. His older brothers were six feet tall by the time they were teenagers. He is actually a little bit small for his age. Before he started school, he was awakened each morning at 4.30 in the summer at 5 o'clock in the winter months to get up and go and work in the dairy barn. Every afternoon or evening, he had to work in the dairy barn again. In the months of row crops, he worked in tobacco and hay and corn and grew up with that kind of life, the youngest of five kids. He was never hungry. He was never cold for lack of shelter. And yet he knew what it was to have other kids make fun of how he was dressed, to make fun of his appearance. But he discovered at school, unlike at home, Whenever you did something right, you knew it. When you had done something well, you could prove it because there was a piece of paper that had an A on it or a 98 
or a 96, or sometimes if it was spelling, maybe a hundred. And so he continued going to school. He loved school. He loved learning. He loved the things that he read about and the places that he could go by watching the old 16 millimeter projector in that huge old auditorium at Trenton Elementary School. He went to the same school from first grade through eighth grade, knew everybody, in fact, because he was a mean little bastard. <laughs> he was the king of the playground, but it was a very small playground. He grew up and then moved away into a strange world, away from a world of 25 students that he had known since he was in the first grade to a world of 400 students of whom he knew none. And then he went to another school and he learned just how friendly small towns can be if you weren't born there. But he still loved school. And he loved learning. He especially learned vocational agriculture. He loved FFA. He came to be an officer and a leader in his chapter. And when he graduated from high school, he wanted to go to Murray State University and become an ag teacher. But his dad had gone to a two-year college in southern Tennessee, and that's where he was going. And so they loaded him up into the pickup truck with his suitcase in the back of the truck and they drove to Henderson, Tennessee and they found out where his dorm was and they put his suitcase in his dorm room and then his dad found out what line he needed to stand in to enroll for classes and he put him in that line and then said goodbye and he went home. But he still loved school and he loved learning. And he finished that two-year school and decided that he had had enough college for a while and so he was going to join the wide world of economic opportunity. He became a cookware salesman <laughs> for all of three weeks. <laughs> and then he became a school bus driver. And then he became a delivery man at a furniture store. But then the world opened up for him and he became a tire builder at Union City Goodyear Tire and Rubber. And he thought from those long days and long hours in the tobacco field and in the hay field and in the dairy barn that he knew what hard work was. And he found out as a tire builder that that was even harder and hotter work. And he, being a relatively bright young man, after seven months of that, decided, you know, I believe it's time to go back to college. And so he did. And he went to Murray State University, but he didn't become an ag teacher. He lowered his standards, sadly, and became an industrial arts teacher. And he taught public school for seven years, and then he decided it was time to move on for that dream he had of becoming a college professor. And so he applied at Ohio State University, which had one of the leading technology education programs in the country at that time. And he not only was accepted, but he became the first technology education major in the history of Ohio State University to get a university fellowship have a full ride for one year and to be paid to go to class and do stuff like that. And the next two years he taught classes to earn the money that he was paid. And he left there and he went to Missouri Western State University and became a teacher educator, became an associate professor in a few years. And then he found out that there was an opportunity to do a postdoctoral fellowship program at the University of Kentucky, the UK, not the KU. Sorry. <laughs> but he had grown up listening to the Wildcats play basketball on the radio in the dairy barn. And before he realized that he was a citizen of the United States, he knew he was a Kentuckian. And so he went to the University of Kentucky for that year, fully expecting at the end of that year, he would go back into college teaching and move on with his professional career. He found out that sometimes the Lord has different plans for our lives than what we had. And he was actually drafted into teaching at an alternative school. And in the first six weeks, he lost 15 pounds and gained at least a dozen gray hairs. But he liked it, oddly enough. He's a bit of a masochist, I have to admit. And then he became principal after that first year. And overnight, his income almost doubled because of that promotion, because of being where it, apparently he was supposed to be at that time. After some years, his kids had all moved out of Kentucky and his wife's mother and brother and daughter were still living in the St. Joseph area, so he moved back there. 
thought he would be an independent contractor for a while, remodeling homes. And he was. In fact, he was so independent that nobody else depended on him. <laughs> and he decided it was time to go back to the safe confines of academia. He began working at Highland Community College, first as a developmental education specialist in Title III, and then becoming the director of institutional research. And if you go home with that guy today, you'll find that he now lives in a two-story home built in 1917 in the craftsman style. A beautiful home with pocket doors and hardwood floors and more windows than you can imagine in one house. He has a wife who is a very devoted and intelligent woman. And that's not an oxymoron in this case. They have between them 22 grandchildren. They have a nice car, two nice pickups, and two horses. He has a nice job, and he wears nice clothes, and he works with nice people. And if you were to go back to that wash tub on the back porch of that old house with no porch roofs and no running water and wake up that six-year-old kid and say, this will be your life, that kid would swear you were lying to him that it was impossible. It is possible because of his stubborn persistence, his determination, his hard work, more than that, the grace of God and American public education. Every decent thing of a physical material nature in his life at this moment, he owes to public education, starting at a two year school, going to a university, and then to another university and still another. None of which he would have been able by any stretch of the imagination to afford. Because of public education. If you were to go to him and show him this campus and these wonderful buildings and these wonderful places and these classrooms and these labs and all of the technical capability of it and all of the facilities and all of that and say, you know what, little Harold, you might get to be vice president here. And that little kid would probably start crying at that point because it seems so impossible. Every one of you are vitally involved in the process of making things better. Sometimes for people who don't understand that, sometimes for people who don't appreciate that, and sometimes for people who absolutely appreciate it. And there are times when you feel like you're absolutely wasting your effort because you just don't see the change that it makes. Well, I guarantee you that Ms. Viola Moore, who showed me how to use a Kleenex to make a crayon drawing look like artwork, would not have imagined. Sidney Dudley, who was my favorite teacher, taught sixth grade and had to gently point out to me when I was 40 years old that she was Sydney. That was not her husband's name. <laughs> I don't think she would be the least bit surprised because she believed in me. Jamie Potts, who taught me out of giving up on speaking contests just because I didn't win my first area and urged me to become a contestant in another area in which I eventually won the state contest, I'm not sure he would be surprised. People that you believe in, and even the people that you don't, owe you more than they can comprehend. I love remodeling because I can always tell if I've made it better or not. And most of the time, I do. Whether it's by redoing the plumbing, whether it's by running new wiring, whether it's by building cabinets, whatever it is, I can look and see, 
And in the business we're in, we don't often get to stand back and say, look what I did. Because it's invisible. But the most powerful things in this universe are invisible. And that is what you're involved in, is in making things better and helping people. Still, in spite of the complexity and the challenge of the decreasing state funding and the stubborn, selfish way that it's legislature sometimes take away money instead of give money, in spite of all that, one of the most powerful enterprises in the world and one of the greatest nations in the world and in one of the best states in that nation. We make things better. That's what our lives are about. And I thank you for giving me this opportunity to share, even if this is the only moment that we share. I thank you for that opportunity. We ask that you raise your hand if you want to ask a question so that Grant has enough time to focus in on you, and um, we'll go from there. Okay. okay. And Grant, if it's, uh, are you going to have to physically go to where they are? Okay. If it's all the way at the back of the room, and in spite of my extremely advanced age, I can actually hear what they said, I will repeat it so you don't have to go all the way back there, okay. unless you really need the exercise. <laughs> okay. Well, since we don't have any questions, thank you all. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Mary Cole. I'm the executive director for workforce training and economic development. And you mentioned um, developmental. You have experience with developmental ed. I would like to know your thoughts and opinions on adult basic education uh -huh. um, and students pursuing their their high school diploma via the GED test. Okay, yeah. And uh, I don't know that I actually listed this on on my uh, creative, I mean my resume, but um, <laughs> uh, I was a certified ABE instructor in Missouri at one time, a uh, relatively short period of a previous millennium. I, I believe that the, uh, uh, that the developmental education, whether it's through the GED or through uh, other programs, are an opportunity and for motivated students a tremendous opportunity. Uh, I've known of people who, you know, at, at the point they were in in their lives, it was no high school was going to let them come back at that age and take classes there. And it was tremendously important to them. And in spite of all the changes and the economic challenges that we have, the high school diploma still opens doors that are closed otherwise. Um, some of those doors that it opened 30 years ago, it now takes at least an associate's or in some cases even a bachelor's degree to open that door. I believe it's a vital function and I believe that it, it's another avenue of hope, another way of making things better. Thank you. And anyone who uh, does not respect it needs to take the test before they have another conversation. Thank you. Another question. Did they promise you ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm Elaine Simmons, uh, part of the Workforce Training Division. A question I didn't have an opportunity to ask you this morning. Could you share uh, your experiences and or awarenesses of workforce education in terms of higher education? Okay, now, when you, when you talk about workforce education, are you talking about other than our specific certificate programs and technical degrees? No, I'm talking about certificate programs, degrees, and career technical education. Okay, all right. Um, you want me to talk about my experience with that, my philosophy of it, what I think of it? <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're not asking questions. <laughs> you get that microphone since 10,000 volts or your book. <laughs> what I would be most interested in is considering you as potentially a 
vice president of this college. What what would you expect from that? What vision would you provide? Okay, all right. Uh, one of the things that I expect from that is uh, highly focused instruction, uh, very clear goals, objectives, and outcomes, and with every with the instruction and the assessment very clearly tied to that. Uh, that's not I expect that out of general ed, liberal arts also, but not to that degree. Uh, I expect uh, awareness of emerging trends, and what I would like is one of those people who can tell you what's emerging before it becomes a trend, but I think that's probably an unrealistic expectation. Uh, I expect uh, cooperation with the uh, basic skills and liberal arts components if it's in an AAS program. Uh, most of the certificate programs are only going to involve whatever basic skill is integral to that particular uh, trade or skill that they're working with. Um, I would expect them to let me know before the end of the fiscal year what they are going to need in order to stay current, both in terms of their training, in terms of facilities, supplies, equipment, and so on like that. I would expect them also to be a partner in soliciting and sustaining partnerships and that will support that. Uh, I know at, uh, at Highland, in our, in our tech program, uh, in our diesel mechanics program, the only reason we're able to sustain that is because the instructor has cultivated industry relationships that support that and, and supply that. Um, I, I mentioned yesterday, so if you happen to be there or be listening in on uh, the uh, distance learning connection, I apologize for the redundancy. But um, I believe it was David Hume, but it was whether it was David Hume or another philosopher, he wrote that any society that degrades its plumbers and exalts its philosophers will have both pipes and theories that can't hold water. <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, you know, of course, I'm, I'm prejudiced in that direction because of my background in industrial arts, but I think if you'll look closely at my transcript, you'll find out I did okay in the academic core areas too. And uh, I'm a, I am a published writer and I don't mean that I sent a company $5,000 to print my book. Okay. Uh, I like poetry, I like writing poetry, reading poetry, essays, etc. And I consider myself to be a relatively literary individual. But I'm also a craftsman, I'm also a carpenter, I'm also a cabinet maker. And um, I'm not going to tell you I'm a renaissance man, okay? but I'm going to tell you that I have a full appreciation for all of the elements that make our lives possible. And I, I, I have very little tolerance for elitism and snobbery, uh, whether it's based on economics or on education or on you know, your ancestry or whatever. I just think that especially in a democratic society, uh, we need to appreciate and support one another. Uh, Mike Rowell's Dirty Jobs, I think it's wonderful application of that that kind of thing. You know, this this dude's made enough money. He doesn't have to crawl in the sewers anymore. Come on. But yet he's showing us, hey look, these things are all important. These things let us live the way we live. And uh, you know, they shut off your uh, sewage service, you're gonna find out how unpleasant life can be in a relatively short time. Especially in this weather. I'll ask a question. Okay, Vic. Vic Martin. <laughs> yeah, you're afraid of that microphone now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, where do you see, not just Kansas, but nationwide, the whole higher educational system is undergoing change. Let's yes. just put it that way. There's been a large, lot of things going on with the profits uh, and publics. What do you see looking down the road five years, ten years, as the role? of institutions like Harvard Community College in serving the needs of the well, we should more the citizens of campus. Let's just say the people. Okay. Essentially, Vic has asked me, what is the future of higher education in America? That may be overly simplifying it. Thank you. I was just going to ask if you could repeat the question. We're not picking up that mic anyway. Okay. So just go ahead. Yeah. Basically, Vic has asked me to identify. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, the uh, what I see has been developing for some time. Uh, the accountability aspect and a pushing in an almost vocational assessment of liberal arts education. Okay. All right, folks, if, if we were supposed to be teaching English classes and art classes and music classes so people could get jobs, you should have warned us 20 years ago about that. Now, from the student standpoint, we have told them for decades, if you get a college degree, life's going to be good for you. And uh, one of my friends, his joke is, uh, you know what the exit question for English master's majors is? Uh, do you want salt with your fries? And it's kind of grim humor because there are a number of people with advanced degrees who aren't able to get employment. So it's a realistic and a reasonable expectation that at least we tell the liberal arts student up front, hey, look, this isn't your best avenue toward making more money. If that's your, your goal, you need to look at a technical world if you can handle it. Okay? You need to look at that and check out that if you're looking, if that's your goal. Um, I think the, uh, uh, I'm not sure how private education is going to fare because I think there's enough additional scrutiny coming that that mushroom explosion we had in the 90s and the first part of this century, uh, I think that may taper off a bit, uh, especially as more and more scams come to light and as there's more uh, intensity on the things that have happened with that with uh, students graduating with $60,000 in debt and a worthless degree. So I think that's, that's an aspect. I believe also that it's an opportunity for uh, technical programs with a precision education that, that you can see, okay, before this, I could get $8 an hour if I was lucky enough to get a job. I can now walk in at 18 with the possibility to earn up to $32 an hour in two years. Okay. Now, we need to understand also that, yeah, you've got that initial jump, and that's terrific, but how long will you stay there? 20 years from now, are you going to feel good about $16 an hour, or are you going to wish you'd done something else? Well, we got the news for you. We'll be here 16 years from now, and if you want to come back and do something else, we'll help you. Um, the... Uh, especially with student affairs, the emerging spotlight on uh, sexual harassment, sexual imposition, et cetera, uh, due process in Title IX issues and in other issues. I think those, I don't know how permanent that's going to be, but it's going to be a hump that we're going to have to, you know, get to the top of and then see where we go from there. Uh, let me just go ahead and add on that, that uh, if the pattern of state funding continues, it's going to become very personal for us here. Okay. Um, you, you already, you've already seen the beginning impact of that and the positions that have been eliminated. And it's going to continue uh, as long as the, the current process continues and the current I don't know, mindset, philosophy, whatever you want to call it, as long as that's uh, governing Topeka then we're going to have to, to deal with that. Uh, I, I mentioned yesterday, uh, I hope I wasn't lied to, but I was told that the Chinese symbol for crisis actually consists of two symbols put together. One means danger, and the other means opportunity. And institutions that are nimble and alert and flexible and responsive are going to have a chance to actually improve their position as this continues for another four or five years, okay? And others are, um, I don't want to be a doomsday prophet by any means, but I think others may very well see their existence threatened. Uh, if you're, you're down in the, the bottom of that um, ratio of enrollment versus cost, uh, you may find the point where it, you can no longer remain viable as an independent institution. And I'm guessing that Barton could easily become the home base for those regional locations, some of it. That's what I mean. I mean, that's opportunity. Okay. 
I, I hope it doesn't turn into depression era opportunity. You know, that's not the kind of opportunity I'm thinking of where uh, in Donovan County, there's a family that accumulated thousands of acres of farmland because they have to own a bank during the depression. Okay. That's not the kind of opportunity I'm talking about here. Okay. I'm talking about because the situation means you can no longer provide service for this area, there's an opportunity for someone to continue to provide service. Other questions? Yes. I'm Tina Berlin. I'm the coordinator for industrial technology programs. And my question is about professional development. Um, <clears throat> It's, it's more because it's the topic of my dissertation, so I'm really just, that's all I think about now. But basically what I want to know is, um, what are your thoughts on professional development in terms of associate faculty members? And what do you think administration's role is in helping to create a learning environment for our faculty? Okay, and when you say associate faculty members, you mean adjunct yes. or part-time people? Yes. Okay. All right, the question is about uh, my, uh, what I would anticipate my role being or what my thoughts are on providing professional development, especially for part-time faculty. Okay. Yes. Now, is this specific to the technical area or just no, in general? Anywhere. Okay, in general. Um, I think that we, uh, that we want to provide professional development uh, and, and not just in terms of this is when grades do you, grades are due, this is the software you use, this is how you report grades, those things about in-house clerical issues, basically. And sometimes schools don't even provide that. You, know, they, you get your letter of uh, contract and, and you're signed up and you start teaching. And hopefully at some point you find out there's a textbook that you can use. Um, but I, I think that beyond that, we need to, for, for all of them and, and for our full-time faculty as well, uh, one of the tensions that I have seen traditionally in education, you can't get hired in an elementary school until you've gone through a formal teacher education program with more hours than you wanted to devote to it. Uh, but you can walk into a freshman college classroom and teach anything if you had enough hours of that thing. Uh, at some point, something magical is supposed to happen when you study a subject long enough, you know how to teach it. Okay, well, you don't. Uh, with no names called, <laughs> have any of you ever in the process of your college career ever had a teacher who really wasn't a good teacher? Any of you? <laughs> Okay, some of you are more kind, some of you were just luckier than others, and some of you have really low standards when it comes to teaching. <laughs> I don't assume that just because you know more than I know about math or art or music that you know more about teaching it than I do. Okay? Now, you can demonstrate to me that you do. Okay? I have studied teaching probably about as much as you've studied art or music or literature or math. Okay, I, I didn't graduate with a degree in arrogance. Okay, I graduated graduated with a degree in teacher education, and it was not at one of those places where we're going to talk about theories and philosophies. Ohio State had a very rigorous <coughs> research-based program in teacher education. These weren't ideas that we thought would probably work. These were things that have been demonstrated and replicated and demonstrated again. And so there is a knowledge base for that. And I think that I should share part of that, but that I should not make everybody do it. Some of you are exceptional teachers. Some of you are excellent teachers. <laughs> Some of you are pretty good teachers. Some of your people here, I don't mean necessary the people in the room. Okay. I'm sure everyone in this room at this moment is an outstanding <laughs> Even if you don't teach, you're an outstanding teacher. Okay. Just want to make that clear. But if you genuinely care about doing a good job of teaching, we can work together. 
and you can show me that you don't need my help. You just need me to know how good you are. Okay? And if I see something, then I think you can do better with this. Until you are perfect at what you do, there's always room for improvement. Okay? Being asked to improve is not being insulted. It's not being told you're no good. It's not being told you're incompetent. It's being told, wow, you could, you could be, I know it's it, you, you, know, you could be even better than you already are. And that applies to me too. And I don't mean that it's the president only who can point that out. It might be the custodian. It might be the maintenance work. It might be my the person across the aisle. It might be my assistant. It might be any one of the deans. It could be anyone. And I believe that people <coughs> either improve until the end of their lives or they die years before they get buried. I believe, you know, I mean, come on, you know, I, I'm not setting you up for an age discrimination claim, okay? <laughs> Look at me, all right? Okay, why in the world is this guy applying for a job like this? Okay, he could probably retire. My mother died at age 99 last year. My father died in 2009, almost 96 years old. Mom was still driving when she was 97. I didn't ride in the car with her. <laughs> My dad was still cutting firewood when he was 92 years old. I think that I am in the prime of my career right now. Okay. I believe that I'm writing the best stuff I've ever written. I believe I'm coming up with the best ideas I've ever had. I believe I know more about how little I know than I ever have. And, and that's one of the things that I don't know if you people fully appreciate the tight wire act that applying for this job is. Okay. I've got to come across as being cocky enough to believe I can actually do it, <laughs> but without seeming that I'm arrogant. Okay? Okay, let's just say I'm arrogant. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I, uh, it takes a lot of confidence to even think about taking this position, but it takes enough humility or self-awareness or as I like to quote Clint Eastwood, a man has got to know his limitations. <laughs> and I think I've learned, and it, and it seems odd that, it, that the more experienced and the more skilled I've become, that actually the more I've recognized how many other people are better at this or this or this or this or whatever. And so what I try to do as an administrator is to be sure they are fully able to use their skills so that all of us look good together. That, that rabbit ran all over the field, didn't it? <laughs> but at least I'm still young enough to realize it. <laughs> you have any other questions? Yes. How, and you may have already addressed this. As I was running in and out. How um, would you interact with our students in your as as a vice president? What do you like to do? Enjoy enjoy doing as far as the campus activities, student activities, ball games, things like that. How do you um, how would you like to interact with them? Can you tell me which particular student you're talking about? <laughs> uh, I would uh, I would like to have enough interaction that they know who I am but I don't want student interaction to be what I am all about. Um, I would like to every now and then send a note to a uh, volleyball player and say, that kill you had last night was awesome, okay? Um, and the same thing with employees, you know, so that they know, I noticed something you did and I liked it and I want you to know that. Um, 
if uh, and I don't know how your process works, if, if I would be involved in student complaints and so on like that, uh, and regardless of whether it's student, employee, uh, fellow administrator, whatever, I would want them to know that I really did listen to them and I and I that they had my attention during that time. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, being visible at uh, athletic events, extracurricular events, and uh, in some cases, maybe, uh, um, well, I, uh, let me freshen my speaking apparatus here. Um, B.J. Smith is our women's basketball coach, and uh, I, my daughter, uh, three years ago, actually talked me into doing a warrior dash. I don't know if any of you know what that is. It's a 3.2 mile cross country run with a little mud, barbed wire, walls and hurdles and cargo nets and other fun stuff like that. Essentially quasi-military or military-like obstacles that you have to do. And uh, without being too graphic, let me tell you that I was so nervous that I suffered intestinal distress for three days prior to that. I was afraid of not being able to do it, not being able to finish, bawling in a number of ways, embarrassing myself, my children, and everyone else in the vicinity, providing some cheap entertainment along the way. So I, I agreed to do it. I started training, and uh, I, would, I had a new hobby ever since then. I've now done uh, 18 of those, including uh, three four-mile events and one 11-mile event, the uh, Tough Mudder. Uh, and boy, does it earn its name. Uh, but anyway, so that's that's my hobby. Well, BJ had seen me doing my workout routine in the wellness center at lunch, and he had me take his girls' team through that routine that I, that I used. Uh, I might offer to do something like that on a highly irregular basis. <laughs> uh, uh, speaking at student groups, uh, occasions, uh, I, I think you've got uh, three faith-based student organizations, uh, possibly getting the opportunity to lead a Bible study or share a devotional or just come and greet. But, you know, with various student activities, the uh, tech clubs that they have, and uh, do you have a forensics team or public speaking or debate or, but anyway, opportunities like that that fit with my skills and interests sharing that. Uh, so that kind of I don't want to be an assistant coach, but I will show up every now and then. <laughs> Any of you do mud runs? Right. <laughs> okay. Any of you? How many of you know absolutely nothing about mud runs and warrior dash and all that stuff? Okay. All right. Well, um, in the past several years, it has become kind of a national phenomenon. In fact, one of my ideas for student recruiting is to start a mud run team and develop a program in obstacle course racing, which is lifetime fitness. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm doing them, okay? Um, and, and you're not going to find me playing, playing full contact football next week. I assure you that. Uh, even if I got to be the football, I wouldn't do it. So, uh, you know, that's an idea. And, I mean, can you imagine how cool it would be to go to Warrior Dash and set up a booth and say, mud your way to a two-year degree? I mean, come on, who isn't going to go for that? I mean, other than everybody else. <laughs> and, and I saw you've already got the water hazard right down there. Right there. <laughs> and trust me, I've been through worse. I've been through worse. Uh, a week ago Saturday, uh, we had a run in Rain Valley, Missouri. Last year I did the same course and uh, that we crawled. We had a creek crossing, and it was about knee deep, ten feet wide. You know, almost jump across it. Well, this year they get ropes stretched across it, and it was about sixty feet wide and of undetermined depth. <laughs> and they said, "Don't let go of the rope." <laughs> and I thought they said, "Your feet won't touch the bottom." And I've waded into rivers and creeks and lakes and gone out. You know beyond the point where you could walk. And so I thought, yeah, right. 
And so I go down all full of myself and I step into the creek. <laughs> Grab that rope, buddy. Uh, and I and I mean you could not stand up on me. You were excuse me, sorry folks, uh, those that are listening in, that was due to the clutchiness of the presenter and not to uh, technical difficulty. But my feet did not hit bottom again until I was within 15 inches of the opposite bank. But uh, if, if you've been in those that area of Kansas and Missouri, you know these these mud bank creeks and rivers. When they flood, they cut almost vertical banks. Now the the channel is still you know kind of sloped and gentle and all, but when you get outside of that and you're up to flood state, I held on to the rope. Held on to the rope. Uh, but you know, sometimes ideas are too quirky for serious consideration, and sometimes you think, I don't know, maybe we could get another 50 students with a mud run team here. So, anyway, sometimes we think so far out of the box, people put the box on top of us. <laughs> other questions? Yes, sir. How, how, address just briefly how you, your family, I know your children are somewhat older, but your wife feel about coming out to such a remote section of the world. Um, it's not as close to Kansas City as where you've been. That's right. Yeah, that's why I haven't mentioned it to any other. <laughs> <laughs> why bring up an issue like that and there's no job offer? I don't know. <laughs> My wife likes her house. <laughs> Um, that wasn't totally facetious. <laughs> uh, now, what I would anticipate doing in order to be available as soon as possible to be renting an apartment, and uh, I'm not going to try to sell a house and buy one in a month. I'm not going to do that. And I would prefer not to make two mortgage payments for six years. Okay. So the uh, uh, I. Uh, have always lived where I work, uh, and I I don't think it can be a legal requirement for every employee to live in Great Bend, okay, and and maybe not even a good idea, maybe we need a little space from each other when we leave here, but uh, uh, I believe that especially the leadership group has got to be here, they've got to be in the community, I don't, I don't know, uh, and this isn't my political platform, but I don't know what right you have to take from a community that you're not giving back to. And uh, if you're going to be proponing or being a proponent of an increased mill levy and it doesn't affect you personally, shut up. Okay, uh, That's more blunt than I would be in talking with those people. But, uh, you know, I, I think that you know, if you believe in it being a community college, then be part of the community. And so, you know, that, uh, uh, and uh, Randa and I will discuss that more fully if the job offer is made. Uh, it's not going to result in a divorce. <laughs> <I'm>, well, <laughs> <laughs> so far she hasn't told me that. So. She knows you're here? I, I didn't. Okay, I'm going to be gone for four nights. I got to tell her where I am. <laughs> <laughs> I tried that once with another wife. It didn't work. <laughs> Other questions? I'll ask one more. Yes. Stepping into any new job. People get nervous, change, right? We don't like change. We all say we like change. We don't like change. How would you, whoever gets this job, how would you approach your first week, several weeks here? Okay. Um, well, first of all, if I don't get the job, I would call the successful candidate and urge them to change as many things as possible <laughs> immediately. <laughs> but yeah. I ended up here. Uh, initially, I'm going to do a lot more listening than speaking. And, and I hope you understand that the nature of the interview job auditioning process requires me to talk a lot more than I, than I normally would. 
Uh, it's not that I'm reluctant to talk, but it's the, and especially in that new setting. I'm I'm pretty sure everybody in the room knows more about Barton Community College than I do. So I want to get a lay of the land. I'm going to ask a lot of questions and I'm going to listen to the answer. I'm going to ask for uh, some of the data that's already readily available and is, you know, maybe already in a report that I can just look at and there may be additional data that I would be asking for. Uh, as came out in one of the interview sessions this morning, I want to know how effective our placement policies are being. I want to know if the factors that we're using to place students in mandatory classes are the best factors available. I would want to look at those correlations and if possible, uh, other statistical analysis to see what would give us the best bet. Uh, I would want to you know, find out about the programs, uh, program reviews that have already been submitted and seeing, okay, these things are promising, these things Maybe peaking out, these things are on decline. Which things should we work on turning around? Which things should we say, you know, the writing's on the wall and we're just uh, prolonging our own agony if we keep ignoring this? So uh, I guess I'm trying to be a, a more of a nutshell answer, a lot of listening, a lot of investigating, and then carefully proposing change. And uh, uh, involving the people who will be affected by and implemented implementing the change, involving them in the entire process of analyzing the information, of making the decisions, choosing the options, selecting one that seems to be the best fit for us. That's about as risky a territory as you get into in this process, because if you're not going to make changes, then why do we need you? And if all you're going to do is change things, why would we want you? <laughs> so I hope that that's a sensible balance for whoever uh, ends up in the position. All right. Speaking of research and data, how many of you are aware that, that empirical data shows that men with beards are more intelligent, accomplish more, and are easier to work with. <laughs> Have you seen that commercial where there are about 12 candidates sitting in the room and the pictures up on the wall show all the CEOs and they're all bald? And the one kid looks at that and runs out and shaves his head and comes back. <laughs> I'm not quite that much of a charlatan. <laughs> you gotta you gotta work the angle, right? Any other questions? Well, I, I want to sincerely thank you for coming over today. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that you could have imagined doing something more interesting and more productive and more rewarding to you. And you took a chance that maybe, you know, maybe it would be worth your time or that at least you could appear to be hospitable. And if that's all it was, thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for your attention. Um, this time we're experimenting with our electronic survey, so please go ahead and complete your electronic survey. If you forgot the link, uh, there's a piece of paper back in the back of the room on the table that tells you what the link is, or if you let us know, we'll go ahead and send it to you. Um, and I've heard some people say, well, they won't really take my opinion into consideration. And I want to guarantee that the Vice Presidential Selection Committee will. We're going to consider all of the comments and take them seriously. So please, please complete those. Um, if you have any other comments, um, there's a comment box. And we invite you to complete that too. Thank you for being here. And Excuse me, oh, one more thing. If any of you need help with that, <laughs> on me or the other candidates, just give me a call. We don't quite encourage. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Thanks for the offer. <laughs> Thank you for attending today. Uh, the attendance has been
great. And um, Dr. Arnett will be standing here for a little bit. So if some of you would like to come up and say something, feel welcome. And I'll stay up here so you can go ahead and leave without having to.